Bill Curtis. And this is the set of Deep Space Nine in Hollywood Soundstage 17. Routinely, a team of technicians, producers, actors transform this space into a facet of the 24th century. From the bridge of the Enterprise to this promenade in Deep Space Nine, Star Trek has entered our homes and ignited our imaginations like a supernova. In this episode of The New Explorers, we'll find out how this science fiction has influenced the new explorers of tomorrow in science and technology. And we'll learn how the pursuit of science has led the cast and crew of Star Trek on journeys where no one has gone before. This is Rocket Park at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. This is a Saturn V rocket, the kind that carried the Apollo astronauts to the moon in 1969. It is proof that science fiction can become science fact. The cast and crew of Star Trek's Enterprise aren't the only ones to boldly go where no one else has gone before. We've already begun to explore the galaxy. Space, the final frontier. ago, NASA was, uh, the new NASA administrator charged NASA with coming up with a NASA motto. And um, there were a number of us that proposed that the Star Trek motto should become the NASA motto. You know, that's exactly what NASA's about. It's about exploring strange new worlds. To explore strange new worlds. To seek out new life and new civilizations. To boldly go where no one has gone before. We didn't carry the day. A lot of people thought that that would be a little too corny. But I thought every American knows that's a NASA motto, and they know it because they've heard it for 20 years on Star Trek. <laughs> Gene Roddenberry created the original Star Trek series back in 1966. The Soviet Union and the United States were hotly engaged in the race for space. Satellites shot into orbit. The first man walked on the moon and probes sailed to Mars and on to the far reaches of the solar system. Scientists were making great advances in space exploration. But none could compare with Roddenberry's invention, a starship that could race across the universe faster than the speed of light. There was always an attempt to have a, a potential scientific foundation for anything that we posited as real in the show, although we were doing science fiction. The idea was, could this possibly someday be done? Could this possibly someday evolve into real science? What the hell is happening? The barriers between quantum realities are breaking down. Other realities are emerging into our own. We did an episode on The Next Generation called Parallels that uh, took as its point of departure an interpretation of quantum mechanics called the Many Worlds Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics which says that basically every time that you conduct an experiment or every time something happens in the universe where there's more than one possible outcome all of the other possible outcomes actually happen but they happen in different parallel universes that are constantly branching off from our own when warp shuttlecraft came into contact with quantum fissure i believe its warp engines caused a small break in the barriers between quantum realities i always try to look for something that's firmly based in real science first and if I can't find something that is uh, an extrapolation of science that we know and understand well today, then I get more speculative. And that speculation is where the science fiction flourishes. Michael Okuda is the Star Trek scenic art supervisor and technical advisor. He helps writers turn Heisenberg compensators and subatomic creatures into good stories. Sure, because remember, he is a creature of pure subatomic force. We don't know how that works. But he might not know how it works, but Okuda and the writer will find a way to make it believable. Yes, and he, he could report back what's, what's happening. I mean, that, that's a bit of a reach, but I'm sure we can find some technical reason to cover that. 
With a believable story in hand, the cast and crew of Star Trek weave science fact and science fiction into a seamless story of the future. Sorry. If they can convince you that it's possible, then they've got you. Take, for example, warp speed. Initiating warp pulse now. We're very much in need of warp speed. If we weren't able to go that fast, we couldn't tell our stories because we only have a half an hour, after all, uh, to get someplace to uh, start a start a uh, a mystery or or postulate some problem to solve, and then another half an hour to resolve it. Warp one, Mr. Sulu. Engage. send a uh, high temperature plasma at a certain frequency through a sort of a magical material that we call deuterium cortinide and that's something that of course we just invented that term just made that up when you're that far out you can make your own rules and that's okay and that's it's just fun and if somebody some kid now in public school can be inspired by that challenge great keep him out of law school <laughs> Navigational readings going crazy? When the warp drive seemed old hat to Star Trek writers, they latched on to another scientific concept gaining popularity. The wormhole. It's now a key element in the third Star Trek television series, Deep Space Nine. The wormhole could make trips a little more convenient for interstellar travelers and bring them to Deep Space Nine. But the mainstay of galactic exploration and storytelling is the starship. They come in all sizes and shapes. It all began with the Enterprise and a design that at the time seemed very futuristic. The Enterprise in 1966 was a flying saucer with some aircraft style struts holding up the warp drive and the engineering section. The Enterprise was fueled by a substance almost unheard of at the time, antimatter. Engineering, maintain full power. Full power. Dilithium crystal circuits failing, sir. We'll have to replace it. Not now. It was exotic, mysterious, and seemed like pure science fiction. Check the bypass valve on the matter-antimatter reaction chamber. Actually, it was founded in scientific theory. In the 1950s, the controlled annihilation of matter and antimatter was recognized by German scientist Eugene Sanger as a potential source of rocket fuel. The nice thing about it as fuel is that uh, a very small amount of antimatter uh, corresponds to a large amount of energy. So that, say, a gram of antimatter could in fact uh, be enough energy to launch a modest-sized rocket ship off the Earth and into space. NASA could send a whole fleet of starships into the galaxy if it could locate just a couple ounces of antimatter. But with today's technology, even a gram of antimatter is extremely precious. We make 10 billion antimatter particles per hour. Suppose we increase that by a thousandfold. It would take us approximately a million years running 24 hours a day, day and night, uh, in order to make, uh, uh, not a gram, I think I calculated about a thousandth of a gram. But what if we could find an economic way to manufacture antimatter fuel? Would our starships look anything like the Enterprise? This is Captain Jean-Luc Picard's quarters. Spacious. Comfortable. T. Earl Grey. Hi. It looks more like somebody's personal apartment than the sleeping quarters of a NASA astronaut, even by current standards. But without the physical or technological limitations of real space flight, one can spend a little more time in space on creature comforts. The Enterprise looks impressive, but when considering the practical needs of a real starship, it's out of proportion, according to Dr. Morgan. What I see is a very large portion of it being devoted to crew space, scientific instrumentation. I see very little of it that is devoted to the storage of propellant or even antimatter. Now the kinds of things that one imagines in regard to antimatter propulsion that go to the stars are going to consist mainly of a tank of hydrogen and some kind of tank if one can produce it of anti-hydrogen. And the payload of the spacecraft is going to be very small in comparison. So a small starship is fine for science fact. But for science fiction, you need room for a cast, crew, and equipment. The film camera and the film camera dolly require a certain amount of finite space. 
unless a set is really intended to be cramped, like two people crawling through a tunnel. You try to make the set as large as you can to accommodate the equipment so that you're not constantly moving walls in and out in order to put the camera where you'd like to see it. Red alert! Zimmerman's fictional starships are a far cry from the pragmatic designs of a real scientist, but they do look good. Compared with the sleek lines of the Enterprise, even Morgan admits that his starship is a little clunky. You know, when one actually makes something like this sometime in the future, as I think maybe we will, it might look very different than how I've depicted it here. It certainly wouldn't have quite as much color as I've put in here. Designing a starship or a space station is one thing. Building it is quite another. NASA engineers would use advanced materials and high-tech instruments. On Star Trek, Zimmerman and his crew do it a little differently. The flooring is vinyl. It looks like a metal diamond plate. The uh, rest of it is built out of wood. Uh, this is, again, a vinyl diamond plate. And the sides are, uh, are actually uh, some plastic objects that uh, are used in the chemical industry to break up sewage in septic tanks. Deception is a key to designing for science fiction. You can take what is familiar and turn it upside down. And it doesn't look the same, it still looks familiar, but you're not quite sure what it is. A nutmeg grinder. The sockets of a fluorescent tube fixture mounted on salt shakers and a row of high-tech potato peelers. NASA isn't the only space agency searching for cost savings. The Federation relies on the industrial designers of the 20th century. The research and development in designing a chair is really a whole lot of trouble and very expensive. We normally buy automobile chairs and then put a casing around them. That works very well. Making the scene look futuristic and high-tech is a constant challenge for Zimmerman. We use a lot of what I call electronic wallpaper. We use uh, backlit graphics. These panels light up, they blink, they have moving graphics on them. When it all comes together, the design of a Federation starship is very impressive, even to the U.S. government. Some of the members of a company called SAIC, it's a civilian branch of the Defense Department, uh, wanted uh, a command center that they were going to build in Arlington, Virginia, uh, to look like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. So, uh, December a year ago, uh, six guys in suits came out and uh, interviewed. Captain, the Borg ship is closing. Arm the photon torpedoes. Torpedoes armed. Fire the front. The Starship Enterprise is equipped with a 24th century arsenal of armaments to defend against an army of unsavory belligerents. Base is locked. Fire! The term phaser seems vaguely familiar, like much of Star Trek techno speak. It sounds like an advanced laser of some sort, a powerful laser with a really big wallop. But what kind of energy are we talking about? Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory is the home of NOVA, the world's highest peak-powered laser. When it fires, it puts out a peak energy that's on the order of a thousand times all the generating capacity of the United States dead shorted together at once. Now, it's for only a small fraction of a second, but an enormous amount of energy. Making a big laser is one thing. Making a tactical weapon is something else. Science fact or science fiction? We are now capable of building in fairly small packages, and by small, I mean easily small enough to fit on a ship, or now even small enough to fit on an aircraft, high enough power lasers that we can actually put them on a target and destroy uh, missiles. But will 20th century technology be able to pack the wallop of a Star Trek personal phaser into a small handheld laser-powered weapon? Over the last four or five years, we have been developing all solid state laser systems similar to the, uh, the revolution in uh, electronics where we went from vacuum tubes to transistors. Lasers are going under that sort of transition. And so the uh, potential to having a high enough power laser system that you can actually hold in your hand is very real. A handheld laser weapon may be within reach, but will it have a stun setting? It's a phaser on stun. A phaser on stun. Now that's a different question. Uh, there you've got to send out some kind of beam that somehow interferes with our nervous system in such a way that it makes us unconscious. Fire. But there's no permanent damage. Be 
real nice to have something like that, but I don't see how that can be done. I wouldn't be surprised if someday we could do something like that. Getting from place to place in the 24th century is no problem with the handy transporter. In the Star Trek universe, one is disassembled, transported anywhere within a 24,000 mile radius, and reassembled right down to the last DNA strand. No problem for a special effects crew, but a scientist might have a few questions. The uh, problem of putting together, you know, complex molecules like DNA uh, is, is awesome. I always had a dreadful fear that if ever I was dematerialized, that I would never come back again whole. Engaging interlock. Buffers in sync. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, no problem. Energizing. Ridge, you're up. Hi, sir. There is this issue in physics that's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which basically says that you can't simultaneously know the position and momentum of a given particle with arbitrary precision. So if you wanted to transport somebody, presumably you'd have to map out every last atom and particle and electron in their bodies. Engaging interlock. Disassemble them and then reassemble them at some remote location. Buffers in sync. According to Heisenberg, you can't quite map that out. Phase coils are... I'm sorry, I just can't do this. We've got devices in the transporter called Heisenberg compensators that take care of that, but of course, we have no idea how you would build such a thing. Number one. Good luck. The complexity um, of taking a, uh, a Curtis, you know, molecule by molecule, transporting them uh, huge distances in, in uh, no time, uh, presumably, then reconstructing all those molecules and not getting it wrong so you come out someone else. I mean, who knows? You might come out Carl Sagan or, <laughs> or Farrah Fawcett or some linear combination, which would be even worse. Uh, you worry about mistakes. Jackson, where are the others? The man is dead. To get a little recreation on the Enterprise, the holodeck works wonders. You enter a small room in a spaceship, and you walk into a New Orleans jazz club. A Garden of Eden or even a whole western town in the 1900s, complete with a host of extras. The concept raises questions even for cast members like Cole Meany. I, I often think, is the experience on the holodeck of like, you know, going out to sort of have a picnic at a, uh, at a waterfall and some sort of nice, you know, green pastures, which people do occasionally on the show, uh, if that is actually like a real experience of getting good, clean, fresh air, uh, it's one of the things we, we don't know for sure. Computer, end program. There may be a lot of questions about how the holodeck works, but they haven't stopped scientists from making it a virtual reality. We have a project under development now which is uh, designed to generate something like a holodeck. Using helmets and virtual reality, we can create something very similar to a holodeck as far as the user is concerned. Butler Hine works on the Dante project for NASA. He's part of a team that's combining virtual reality with robotics to assist in planetary exploration. What you see here when you first start up is the walking robot Dante. You see it on an empty grid. Once I start walking the robot, I'm creating information in the terrain. Once it takes a laser scan from that purple scanner, the laser scan comes in as a terrain map. This is a map of where the rover's been. It's kind of like the holodeck where you see that yellow grid. The interesting thing about virtual reality is you notice that I can zoom in, look at the winch motor, pull myself up so that I'm looking at the sensor, or back away so I'm seeing the whole scene. Uh, I'm free to fly around in the scene however I want. The holodeck of the Enterprise with its yellow grid has had a surprising influence on the Dante project. Actually that, uh, that grid was not our original design. Our original design had a, uh, a 
black and white checkerboard, kind of like a chessboard, and uh, the robots would pop up on this. But uh, one of the requests that we got uh, by the operators was, uh, we hate that checkerboard, that looks ugly. Uh, we want something that looks like the holodeck. So that black background with the yellow grid is designed to be similar to the holodeck that you have on the show. The crew of the Enterprise may boldly go where no one else has gone before, but sometimes they use a little caution with the help of sensor probes. Now scientists are making some bold moves in robotic sensors that are catching up with science fiction. There was a show uh, on Star Trek The Next Generation that was a, a very similar use of technology to what we're developing right here. Uh, it was a show in which Geordi puts on a suit which allows him to feel as if he's in a probe that's down in a ship that's very hazardous. I feel like I'm actually here. I mean, there, in the Jeffries tube. That's very similar to the technology we're developing. We're trying to use telepresence and virtual reality to give the operator the impression that they are in the remote location with the robot, that they are the robot itself. I think this is going to work. The Dante 2 project was an ambitious step towards building a probe that would someday explore the planet Mars. All Dante had to do was climb down into a crater of an active volcano in Alaska and then climb back out again. Simple enough? Not quite. After initial success, Dante got stuck on the side of the crater. Every effort was made to free the probe by remote control, but virtual reality is not exactly the same as being there. Finally, two engineers braved the elements and scrambled down into the crater to free Dante II and bring it back. NASA's virtual reality probe may not be at Star Trek level yet, but to the scientific team, the Dante II field test was not a failure. We have lots and lots of very rigorous challenges, so doing field work on the Earth helps you to learn how to solve those challenges and, and helps you to get equipment and operating systems and robotic systems that are very mature because you've learned by doing field work in rigorous terrestrial environments how to make them work. NASA scientists and engineers still have plenty of work ahead of them to get Dante ready for more. Exploring other planets on the Enterprise is easy by comparison. Actually on Star Trek, before you explore a planet, you have to create one. It's a planet of shapeshifters, uh, so you'll see very little architecture. It's mostly rocks and vegetation. Zimmerman uses 20th century materials and scenic techniques to create the illusion of a rocky planet. We uh, go out to a rock face in nature and take a rubber cast of a real rock, and then from that we shoot fiberglass and resin into the mold and uh, create skins, and from the skins, the carpenters fabricate rocks like this. Zimmerman is continually challenged to create an exotic alien setting with down-to-earth materials. These trees are century plants. They're a tree that grows in the desert. They're about as alien-looking as any plants that are readily available on Earth. Zimmerman and his team create landscapes of other planets to carry the story forward. But why would NASA scientists simulate alien worlds? We built this to be a planetary surface terrain simulator, basically as a test bed for driving or operating robots that would operate on a planetary surface to just kind of get some sense of how well they'll go up a hill, how well they'll negotiate a boulder. One of the reasons that we have these backdrops uh, in this simulator is that when we're operating a vehicle in here, we're actually doing it from another place. It could be across the country. And so having this backdrop really gives you a much better sense of being on another planet when you're operating from a remote location. We've already begun to explore nearby planets, and there are billions of stars still beyond our reach. The Enterprise has found new worlds, but is anybody really out there? We are being hailed. All stop, Mr. Crusher. Open a channel. The crew of the Enterprise and Deep Space Nine routinely encounter alien life forms. Sometimes they're friendly. I want to tell you how happy I am to be assigned to the Enterprise. Sometimes a little pushy. Sometimes they're an eternal nuisance. A 
Few of them are very unusual, but most of them look remarkably similar to humans. They breathe oxygen and speak English extremely well. Our world is reactivated. Our people express their gratitude. Scientists have yet to verify that the universe is populated with sentient beings, but according to one cast member, it's only a matter of time. I believe that we'd be pretty uh, egotistic to think that we're the only uh, cogent creatures in the universe. Armin Shimmerman plays Quark, a Ferengi entrepreneur who runs the bar on Deep Space Nine. When you're looking at the noise from nature... Dr. Jill Tarter basically agrees with Armin Shimmerman. She's the project scientist and manager for Project Phoenix, a privately funded effort to search for evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. It's the continuation of the SETI research that began back in 1960. They listen to the heavens with radio telescopes. The radio spectrum is broad, and it turns out that the best signals to look for or listen for um, are the kinds of things that, as far as we know, nature can never produce. So if you find such a signal, you've either found a new brand of astrophysics that you didn't expect, or you found evidence of another technology. Believing in sentient beings who send radio signals from another planet is a long way from actually encountering one. We talk about looking for a needle in a haystack, but that's easy compared to perhaps finding an extraterrestrial uh, radio signal from a distant civilization. Action! That's two signals. However, if you're an actor on Star Trek, you can help along the evolutionary process, especially if you are the first of your species. I created this species many years ago on Star Trek The Next Generation. You work with your females. They were described as short humanoids with large balls. I, I imagine they were referring to the top of their head. Um, those first characterizations I didn't like after a while. The character I've created in Quark is a little bit more noble, a bit more mercenary. And he has very nice togs, you can see. And uh, that was an indication to me that, uh, that he was doing quite well. Quark the Ferengi is one of a multitude of species that inhabit the Star Trek universe. That diversity may also exist in our universe. I suspect that evolution taking place on another planet over billions of years will produce an end product or a, a series of products which are fantastically different than what we have here on Earth today. How does that feel, Mark? Uh, warm. It's one of the other warm day. Well, we're, yeah. And when it comes to galactic evolution on Star Trek, the man responsible for supervising the creation of new species is Michael Westmore. His godlike powers are limited to foam rubber, latex, and heavy doses of makeup. But he and his crew make the most of their materials and their imaginations. I do a lot of research by looking at uh, the Smithsonian Magazine, National Geographic, um, even down to the children's magazine, Zoo World and Ranger Rick. When we first started doing our, our Klingons for the television show, I started looking around for something to base it on. And I picked the dinosaur bones. I found a wonderful book that had a cross section of dinosaur vertebrae and things. All you have to do is like, take a little quarter section of it and duplicate it right on down the, the front of the head. Science fiction has the problem that when we try and dramatize it here, uh, we're limited to human beings and, and the uh, amount that you can stretch some latex in order to create a different creature. And I think our imaginations, therefore, are not as fruitful as I think the universe will be. On Star Trek The Next Generation, Brent Spiner plays a character that's neither alien nor human. He's Data, an android with superhuman physical and mental abilities. I have experienced a brief power surge in my positronic subprocessor, but I am fine. In the 24th century, Dr. Noonien Soong created Data in his own image. But back in the 20th century, Dr. Rodney Brooks at MIT is taking a more humble approach. This is a uh, robot that's really based on principles that we've seen in looking at real insects and how they coordinate their legs. It uh, looks like one. Yeah, it, morphologically, it looks very similar because that happens to be a very good engineering solution to getting over rough terrain with small legs. Now, how do we save ourselves? Well, if we 
It's got sensors in front, it's whisker felt, my hand that's backing off and it's going to try and figure out how to go around. It's not doing any long range sensing here. So it's going to touch this one. So it's it's running that one. So it's yeah. going to back up again. Uh, except oh, he got caught. He got caught. <laughs> of course, that's never happened before. No. <laughs> this robot may not be as agile as Data, but even Data has some bad days. This was a head that was used in an episode called Time Zero when uh, Data had his head blown off and it rolled, it had to roll across the floor like a bowling ball. And I actually had a cast off of Brent's face. This was literally a mold taken uh, right out of a, a negative mold from him. And to make it look kind of business-like on the other end, I cut up computer chips and inlaid them in there. How close are you to the real data or to a humanoid? We're a long way from the real data. Uh, but what we've done is build a robot which has the same form as a human, although up till now we haven't got the skin on it. We're working on, on building a plastic skin for it. And we use electric motors instead of muscles. We use steel instead of uh, bones as the structure of the system. And we have little computers which sense the temperature of the motor to see if the motor's working too hard and the body's getting too hot. And we want the robot to be aware of that so it can feel itself interacting with the world. Robots move by small electric motors. But to make a lifelike android that moves, Ian Hunter of MIT is developing artificial muscles. Nature developed muscle 550 million years ago, and uh, it's a tough act to beat. The artificial muscle fibers we're developing contract and relax like muscles in your own body. The wheel that we've produced is a water wheel, and it's being driven by a single artificial muscle fiber. The fiber is about double the diameter of a human hair, and is able to drive that comparatively large water wheel. The artificial muscle fibers used in these eyes here produce uh, over a hundred times more force than corresponding human muscles. So if you were to build an android out of these fibers, that android could potentially be a hundred times stronger than a human. With the development of synthetic muscles, scientists are inching toward the realization of Dr. Nguyen Sung's masterpiece. But then there's that little problem of duplicating Data's positronic brain. The brain is actually sitting a few feet away from the robot with a big cable connecting it to the robot itself. The human brain is a, is a vast mystery. I don't expect to get close to Data in my lifetime uh, because of the complexity of what it is we have to explore there. But along the way, there's other things we can do to make computers more usable. And we see that in Star Trek, too. Data isn't the only computer around. Computer, what are the current power conversion levels? Power conversion levels are at 97.2%. The computers on the Enterprise are big and powerful. However, Star Trek writers have been hard-pressed to keep ahead of 20th century computer technology. During the uh, run of the original series in the late 1960s, uh, there were no such things as PCs. Uh, there were no such things as handheld calculators. In the old Star Trek show, you see people using computers in a way that seems silly to us now, because we right now have computers that are more advanced than what that show was predicting for us to have 400 years from now. And right now, uh, the second show, The Next Generation, is predicting computer capability that, while advanced, will probably be surpassed in 10 or 20 years. So they're predicting technology that 400 years from now that we will actually achieve in, in just a couple of decades. Science fiction very often leads the way to, to science fact. Like going to the moon, for example. Somebody was writing about that 100 years ago. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I wonder if John F. Kennedy would have been in a position to say that had it not been for the science fiction writers 60, 80, 100 years before suggesting that as an idea. Uh, if someone hadn't dreamed that, would the scientists have been able to come to him and say, we can actually do that? Mr. Spahn. Yes, Captain. We were there with the communicator, beep, and talking to people in the late 60s. Enterprise. Enterprise. Spock here. Kirk here. Spock here, Captain. There seems to be a... I did have occasion a, a few days ago to be using my own portable cellular phone. Somebody saw me doing it, burst into laughter, and said, this is Leonard Nimoy using the thing from Star Trek, the communicator, as a telephone. 
Now this is the original communicator and we're using it today. Don't you have a problem trying to stay ahead of the guys who copy uh, your ideas? I, I, I think a lot of our hand props are now uh, becoming obsolete because the uh, you know electronics engineers are now uh, uh, you know they're, they're taking a lot of the, the science fiction concepts and making them real. One place where engineers are rapidly transforming hand props into useful tools is the doctor's office. This is the sick bay from the Starship Enterprise, under the direction of Dr. Beverly Crusher, with enough gadgets from the 24th century to make a doctor from Mayo Clinic green with envy. This is a scanner Dr. Crusher can pass over the body of a patient and diagnose ailments ranging from the common cold to Altarian encephalitis. She has a hypo spray that can inject medicine into the body without penetrating the skin. But wait a minute. Here in the 20th century, we can inject medicine into the body carried by a jet of air. And this device will soon be available, allowing you to look through walls and see objects on the other side. Inventions like this in the 20th century keep the writers of Star Trek and science fiction very busy to stay ahead of science fact. The powerful, compact medical scanner has been a key tool for the science fiction doctors of Star Trek. From Bones and Crusher to Bashir, played by Sidi Gal Fadil. I should think the tricorder will be a real thing in the, in the future, a diagnostic device which is really based on scanning. Um, uh, how on earth they're going to do that is for them to work out. Scientists may not have medical tricorders yet, but they are making significant advances in diagnostic scanning. Dr. Richard Jennings of NASA. We have had limited ability using some special probes to read things such as brain waves without touching a person with a, uh, a peripheral sensor. The PET scanner uses positron emission tomography. It can see right through the skull and indicate areas of mental activity. Medical professionals can use it to locate sites of brain seizure, so neurosurgeons can go in, reset that area, and eliminate the problem. Doctors consider the PET scanner a diagnostic breakthrough, but there are drawbacks. It's very cumbersome and expensive and takes some very cold uh, type equipment. But science may be on the verge of another breakthrough. Dr. Crusher's medical tricorder is possible now, according to Dr. Tom McEwen of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. This technology is the uh, Star Trek tricorder. This is the, the first prototype of a tricorder. Uh, and I, I can't get into a lot of detail because of our patent position, but uh, we have medical applications uh, that have some similarity to the uh, tricorder. The key to McEwen's tricorder is not some mystery material, it's radar. These radar waves go through things, and they go through human tissue. And so there is the potential to detect and uh, eventually image uh, things inside human bodies. And we have some results already that are spectacular. With medical technology rapidly catching up with Star Trek, the producers have taken the next giant step. In the newest series, Voyager, Robert Picardo plays a virtual physician. He's a, a holographic medical doctor. He's designed to be sort of an emergency supplemental aid to the regular ship doctor if the, if the regular doctor is too busy or is incapacitated in some way. He's sort of a part-time computer-generated uh, doctor that you can just access the program and he appears and he does the job and then you turn him off and he disappears. So he's, he's not programmed to work for long periods of time and isn't at all happy about it when the ship's doctor is killed in the pilot and he is forced to provide all the regular uh, sick pay services for the entire for the entire hopefully seven years we're on television <laughs> holographic doctors may still be science fiction but a station in space is a star trek prediction that's already become science fact at least on a limited scale the russian mir space station has been in orbit since 1986 there are now plans for a joint space station with the U.S., Russia, Japan, and Europe. But while the plans keep changing, the staff of Star Trek have not wasted any time in designing and building their own space station, Deep Space Nine. The scale may seem modest at first, but in science fiction, that's not a real limitation. 
Deep Space Nine is not even a Federation design. It's a second-hand station built by the Cardassians, with ample room for a variety of activities. This is the promenade on Deep Space Nine. Uh, Herman Zimmerman, our production designer, wanted this to be a, an expansive place to show that this is, in fact, an interstellar crossroads. Well, and you can get your exercise, uh, the crew can walk, everybody who lives here and there. Yes, there's every convenience of home. Here is, for example, a directory. You can theoretically hit this button and it'll tell you what's, what's where, and of course, if only if you can read Cardassian. Mm -hmm. A restaurant? This, in fact, is a symbol of the Bajoran religious faith. Oh. Since we're such a multicultural, interstellar society, the uh, Bajoran religious faith is respect re reflected and respected here. And they have services, I presume, periodically? Reg regularly. A bar on the other side? This is the infamous Quark's Bar, where you can play Dabo and do whatever else you want there. This is a place where you can get uh, interstellar sushi. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this looks like a shopping mall of some kind, and a directory? This is uh, what Rick Berman calls our Rosetta Stone. This is our, uh, our building directory, but because Earth people are only one part of it. We have the this, this same information in Ferengi, in Vulcan, in Klingon, in Cardassian, and Bajoran. Well, it's all the comforts of home, mm -hmm. indeed. Yeah. So right this way, we have the Ferengi Current Exchange. Is this like uh, an ATM machine? Yeah, it's sort of like an interstellar ATM. Mm -hmm. Since the Ferengi are uh, portrayed as the robber barons of the, of the galaxy, they, <laughs> they would, of course, portray themselves as honest banking at current Ferengi rates. <laughs> But this will allow you to exchange currency between uh, Romulan and uh, Cardassian, Ferengi. So if I just put in my cash station card, I should be able to get some currency. Only back. if you know your PIN number. Oh, okay. okay. This engineering model of NASA's space station is not as roomy as Deep Space Nine. There's no promenade. Quark's bar would have a little difficulty fitting in. And there is a distinct lack of aliens running around. Nope. This is for pure scientific research. And here it is, a science section for research and experimentation and a section for crew quarters. It's designed for no-frills practicality, as I found with astronaut Bill Shepard. Of course, you don't have to worry about climbing into this thing. You'll just be floating yeah, from one place to another. Right That's hard to get used to. But if we consider the question of how do we live for an extended time in space, this is what we've come up with. Well, you'd need a, a large module like this to accommodate uh, the habitability for the crew. Uh, we'll have a crew of four, and they're going to be up here nominally 90 days. Uh, some experiments that we're looking at will be run over longer periods, so we need a crew to be up here 180 days, possibly longer. What about the shower? I didn't know you had one on well, the shuttle. Well, it's a new thing. We don't have one on the shuttle, but it's a new thing for a station, and this will be a place where uh, the crew can get in. Uh, we'll have a controlled volume with some airflow in it. And it'll basically keep the water uh, trapped in the shower and then recycle. And this is how people will stay clean. It's really something we're going to need to do on a regular basis because right now one of the biggest issues with habitability on the shuttle is uh, the inability to, to really get clean every once in a while, whether it's every other day or so or every week. Or, and so for a prolonged stay in space, we're going to need that, and it'll be part of the HAB module here. Bill, you've taken your shower. Is this now where you sleep? All right. This, this is, we're looking at the sleeping bag, uh, which is the bag that we fly right now on the shuttle. Uh, for a while on the station, we won't have this habitation module up, so we'll have to be sleeping either in a bag like this uh, tied to a row of lockers, or there will be accommodations for three in the Russian side of the station over the Russian segment. Uh, but it's very comfortable and you just jump in it and zip it up. Bill, does this mean you will always have a room with a view? Well, Bill, the HAB module will have uh, two portholes or windows like this uh, and you'll be able to look out and, and basically see the Earth and see where you are. To get into space and onto a space station, you don't need a starship, you need a shuttle. Star Trek has a whole fleet of them including one name for Stephen Hawking. Back on Earth, we have NASA's space shuttle. But it's not the only option. Three, two, start. We have ignition. The experimental DCX rocket is a reusable craft made by McDonnell Douglas. At first, you might wonder whether it's science fiction or science fact. Ascent is good. We're in the translation mode. 
The DCX has not made it to space yet, but it can maneuver in the atmosphere like no other rocket. Landing gear cord, landing gear limit. Landing high thrust, acceleration ramp down. We got a touchdown. Touchdown, right on gear, right on gear. Engine shut down. All right! If the DCX continues to perform well, it'll have some interesting uses. Project Director Bill Gaubatz. You'll be able to go down to a spaceport, catch a space plane, um, maybe go to a, uh, a hotel in space for, uh, for, for the weekend, for a week. Japan, for example, uh, they have a long-term program. Uh, what are they working towards? A, uh, a hotel in space by around the year 2015. Uh, perhaps a first uh, lunar outpost uh, by around 2020. If we go to space and we colonize space, certainly there will be hotels, there will be restaurants, there will be a Taco Bell. Uh, th there will be places that are familiar to us in this very unfamiliar setting. If there are hotels, there may be casinos, I'll have a wonderful time. Not everyone may be inspired by Shimmerman's vision to become an interstellar entrepreneur. But cast members do recognize their unusual influence on Star Trek fans. If there's any one thing that is greatly and consistently satisfying to me about having been involved with Star Trek now for 28 years, it is that moment when a scientist, a young, brilliant astrophysicist or whatever, a biologist, or, uh, somebody in the sciences says to me, I grew up on Star Trek, I'm a scientist, I'm in science because of Star Trek. Dr. Mae Jemison saw Star Trek years ago. It sparked her imagination. She studied, trained, prepared for that day when she'd board the space shuttle and lift off into orbit. I'm really excited. I guess my feeling is more one of excitement and one of being able to, um, to stretch and to go somewhere that I haven't gone before and somewhere I've always wanted to. That day came on September 12th, 1992. Hi, May, from Chicago. So, how are you? After her triumph as an astronaut on the space shuttle Endeavor, Jemison took a side trip to join the crew of the Enterprise. Phase distortion is dropping. The next transport window opens in 42 seconds. How long will we have, Lieutenant? 36 minutes, sir. May Jemison, yes. I mean, she was so excited when she was on the, on the Next Generation show to know that someone as a child was inspired to literally reach for the stars because of this thing. You know, it's, it's quite incredible. Enormous impact. It's at times humbling because uh, there are the occasions when scientists expect me to be able to follow these extremely complex and profound theories that they're working on because I'm the guy who in some way or my character in some way influenced them when they were young. You know, well, they've obviously gotten educations and and gotten their, their gray matter together in a way that I never have, you know. The conditions at Edwards Air Force Base are good. At Huntsville, Alabama, a whole new generation of Star Trek viewers and potential astronauts are going to space camp. In the course of a week, they'll find out how to work in zero gravity. They'll learn some of the unique aspects and challenges of working in space. And they'll even get a taste of life in a space station. Space Camp may not be Starfleet Academy, but the kids seem to take it just as seriously. All right, count left six, radar altimeter to one. Check. They even participate in simulated shuttle launches, complete with unexpected emergencies. Capcom, what is the problem with Orbiter? Uh, voltage. Star Trek may give viewers a strong vision of an interstellar future, but actual participation in the real thing is a pretty powerful experience. This time, science fiction may have to take a back seat to science facts. These kids are following in the footsteps of those who have boldly gone before. And who knows, some of them may go even further, out into the stars. The Wright brothers just didn't happen to go out and put some wings together on a bicycle and say, gee, I wonder what this is good for. It was the vision of being able to fly that uh, really has, has driven people. And now I think that's just the vision of being able to really live, explore, open space is the next vision. And, and what's exciting about that is it's, it's limitless. <laughs> the appetite for 
wondering about the future is insatiable. I am certainly one who hopes. I am filled with hope. And this, this show certainly talks about that. That there is hope. Star Trek has created a future in which our children and their children will be the new explorers of tomorrow with distant worlds to discover. It's a future where science and technology are the tools used for the good of humanity and those we encounter along the way. <laughs>